Hello and welcome to episode 263 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now joining me on today's episode is the singer of an amazing band called Story of the Year. That's right, I'm joined by Dan Masala. On today's interview, we focus on the band's background, all the bands that Dan used to listen to and made him want to pick up a microphone. But not only that, we talk about the band's brand new album, Tear Me to Pieces. Now I say this a lot and I think in 2023, even though we're just in April, we've been really spoilt. But their new album, Tear Me to Pieces, is one of my contenders for album of the year. It's absolutely awesome. And as soon as you've listened to today's interview, go and check it out. Either buy it or stream it or do what you do. But it's unreal. And then let me know on any of my social media channels just how much you loved it. Just before we get to my interview, I want to touch base and talk about my last episode. On episode 262, this was one of my most downloaded episodes already this year. Daniel Winter Bates from Berry Tomorrow. A heavy interview. We focused a lot on mental health and it was really, really positive. I've had some incredible emails come through for people that have said it's really helped them. I've had some amazing tweets and Facebook comments and a massive thanks again for Daniel for coming on and being so open and so honest. It was one of my highlights of the year. Now, let's focus purely on Dan Masala. This interview is awesome. But just before we get to it, I want to give a big shout out to the sponsors of the podcast, Richer Sounds. Without those guys, this podcast couldn't continue. And thanks to those guys, they really helped me go that extra mile. So if you're in the market right now for a new TV or a hi-fi or a stereo system or whatever you want, go and hit up richersounds.com. Right, there's only one thing left to do now is to get straight to the interview. So here's me and Dan talking all things music. All so right. Dan, uh, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Dan, what I like to do uh, on this podcast for anyone that might be tuning in, and you never know, they might not know about Story of the Year. So I like to take it right back to the very start and tell me what were those first albums that maybe as a child you remember buying that made you fall in love with music? Oh, man. Yeah, I, I always loved music uh, from a young age. Um, but I think like the first time that I really was like, ooh, I want to be in a band was, it was, uh, you know, it was all the cheesy late 80s metal kind of stuff, you know, like um, Poison and Motley Crue. And well, Motley Crue was older, but Poison was like the one that was like kind of my, my favorite. Uh, and Skid Row. Sebastian Bach from Skid Row is still one of my favorite singers of all time. But I would like run around my room and be like, "Don't need nothing, a good time," you know. Um, and that you know, that that was just like the first things that like made me want to be in a rock band, you know. But but then uh, when grunge kind of hit, uh, Nirvana was like, okay, because I had started playing guitar. But by that point, I could actually play their songs, you know. I was like, okay, these are a little easier to digest. And yeah, that grunge thing, and that moved into like punk rock and stuff, and uh that that it was yeah just just a never-ending uh oh i like that i want to do this i want to do that for a living you know and uh, luckily i made that happen somehow nirvana's a great one i remember i was at secondary school i just started i was only 11 years old but uh my parents paid for me to have guitar lessons i was like oh amazing and I remember they gave me Nevermind on tape and I thought, God, if I could just play this and in one lesson I'd learnt poly because it was just four chords and I realized like Actually, I might be able to do this. Like Kurt Cobain's my idol at that age. And Absolutely. I was like, do you know what? This is easier than I thought. Yep, that's exactly how it was. And uh, yeah, I was like, oh, I can I can actually play this. Uh, yeah, uh, but they're also great songs. You know, it's just genius songwriting, but uh, happens the simplicity actually helps for guys who are trying to learn how to play guitar. But yeah, I still love Nirvana. I th I, they were very influential on, on on all of my musical tastes, but... Yeah, I mean, all that stuff at that time, you know, I, I loved Pearl Jam as well and like uh, just all that stuff. But and then that turned into like Green Day around the same time, which kind of went into more of the punk rock side. And yeah, I love all that. So, I mean, you mentioned Green Day then. That was the first band I ever saw live. And they're the ones that kind of made me realize that even though Dookie sounded so good on CD, when I went to a gig, it could sound even better because it was there. It was in your face. Your ribs kind of yeah. shook. Can you remember that first gig? And, you know, don't lie to me if it's an embarrassing run or a rubbish one and try and sound cool. What was that first gig that you remember going to that, you know, you got that buzz and were like, oh, man, this is incredible. Yeah, I mean, I, throughout all those early days, I never went to any shows or anything, really, because, you know, we were in St. Louis and like not a lot of 
big cool stuff came through but um i actually played a show when i was like 15 or 15 ish and it was like the first time i ever was in a club like experiencing music weirdly enough i mean i just watched it on tv so much that but i played a show before i ever even went to a show but um i remember one of the first like club shows uh i saw deftones like at a oh, small wow. club with limp biscuit opening oh um, wow at, at like 300 capacity club here in st louis called the galaxy um that was in like 96 i think uh and that's the first like show i remember being like wow this is like this is it like this i'm here and this is really happening uh, i remember seeing goldfinger around that same time at the same venue it was just like all the like more punk rock kind of bands that's what really i started going to shows to see I never like went and saw the Beach Boys or anything or, you know, it's like like nothing that like a lot of people are like, yeah, my mom and dad took me to see this old band, you know, but I never had that. My mom and dad weren't really music people that much. So I kind of had to find it all on my own. That's awesome. And I mean, was that when you kind of knew at that point you wanted to be in a band yourself? Or was it a bit later on? Um, I mean, I was already I already knew that I loved playing music by that point, but that was definitely the solidifier of like, you know that like you're saying that live experience when you see it in real life it's it's a whole different thing you know than seeing it on tv you know just being there in that disgusting room full of gross sweaty people you're like whoa this is this is what i want to do forever <laughs> but uh yeah no it's uh, yeah you you know instantly if if you love that or not when you go you, it's in you after that i mean the history you've got with story of the year is so big and there's so much to talk about but what is it that you think and i, I had recently brandon boyd on from um incubus and jim adkins from jimmy Eat world and they've guys have been going over 20 years and what is it that you think that kind of keeps you hungry because you know don't get me wrong it must be the best job in the world getting up and playing music but there must be challenges especially over covid when everyone had that taken away but what do you think it is that keeps you going? Because some bands kind of fade out after two or three albums. Yeah, I I, I don't know. It's 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 surprising to me half the time that we're still a band after twenty years. You know, um, most of it is we're all friends from from this same area. We all still live right around here in St. Louis, and we grew up, you know, hanging out and skateboarding and just listening to music more than being a band together. Like we we were just always friends. So uh, it's the same four guys that I knew. You know. 25 years ago so i think just the friendship alone keeps you keeps you motivated and keeps you going um but there's times when you know you don't want to get up and go on a tour and play a show every single day you know sometimes it does it, it still can become a job sometimes but uh but for the most part yeah like you said it's it's a great it's pretty cool thing to be able to get paid to do from going on stage and running around and yelling at people but um but yeah it has its ups and downs and you know somehow we just keep it going and you know i love music enough to where i'm always motivated to to just always want to do it you know and being inside it must be difficult because you're in the actual band so i'm saying it as like an outsider who gets to see it from the outside but did you really see that kind of growth from the inside so remember those early gigs and probably battle of bands and all these sort of things that bands go through but did you notice the kind of crowds getting bigger and seeing your name going up the post each year on a festival like slightly bigger and a few more people wearing your t-shirts at the gigs or was it kind of all a blur because it was all happening and you're just kind of so involved in it yeah it's a little bit of both i mean it's definitely a blur when you're in the middle of it um but that is the only way that we could judge if we were getting bigger was like by the size of the crowds or yeah like what shows we were on because we would tour so much in the early days like just pretty much never take days off like we were 300 and something days a year just playing shows constantly for the first five or six years um so yeah you don't you don't see anything other than what where are we at what city are we in where what is this tour that we're on you know it's like so you don't really see that the song's getting played on the radio you don't really know these things as much you hear it but you're like you just judge it by the crowd and the reaction and and how how it feels so yeah it, it it's very much a blur and in, in those early days for sure and what is their kind of, I mean, when I interview some bands that are starting out or just on their second album tour or something like that, they have these goals. So they want to play like the main stage at Download Festival or Reading or Leeds over in the UK or at Slam Dunk. They want to see them, you know, not on the smaller stage, but the actual main stage. And because you've been there and done all this and you've had those big slots and you've seen yourself go higher and higher, do you kind of still have those targets in place or are you just doing it now because you enjoy it and it's just 
something that's inside you? Yeah, um, I, there's you. You always have like goals, I guess. Yeah, like, but yeah, I don't know. That is, it's hard to say because yeah, we've we've kind of surpassed any goal that we ever thought we were gonna have. You know, it's like we surprised ourselves with. I didn't think that we'd still be a band twenty years later. You know, I had no idea. Um, so yeah, we luckily you know met most of those goals over the years, and yeah, I guess it's just kind of like maintain some level of of <laughs> success is all that it really is. It's just. I just want to be able to keep doing this uh, successfully and hopefully make some money in the process and then, you know, just do that as long as I can. And at the moment, um, we I've, I've literally just been sent a an advanced uh, promo, but as we're sitting here, your album isn't out. It's about to come out, Tear Me to Pieces. Now, yeah. how was it going into this? Because obviously you've come the back off a of lockdown, which is just horrendous, where I think musicians and people that, kind of tour with bands were hit the most because some people could work from home but if you're a sportsman or a musician or a performer you couldn't so yeah. did you kind of ever think this would actually come out was there a point when you were like fuck like this album isn't ever going to come out because of everything in the world's gone crazy yeah uh luckily we were like kind of in between and we were writing at the time anyway so we weren't like we weren't touring and like we didn't have a lot going on right whenever you know every everything shut down um, so it was kind of like, okay, well, we can't do anything, so let's just kind of keep working and keep focusing on writing songs. And um, we had so many songs written, even at the beginning of that, um, but then we just kept writing. We probably had 40 or 50 song ideas like for this record. Um, and then you know we whittled them all down and then kept writing and kept going because, yeah, we couldn't really get back out yet. It was, it was an all right time for you know writing and, and making a record because that was all there was to do. So... But yeah, I didn't know if it was going to be worth putting anything out, if we could ever tour again or anything. So luckily, uh, finally, we got through all that. And now we have a really cool project that came out of all of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it feels good to now finally be able to get back out and play shows again. Uh, but yeah, who knows? It's awesome. Crazy. And you did, did you get to work with Colin Britton? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He produced a new record. Yep. Yeah. I mean, he's worked with bands like Papa Roach, Five Seconds of Summer, uh, one of my favorite bands, Dashboard Confessional. So... I mean, there's a real variety, but he, he gets this huge sound for me that sounds polished, but it's still the band you go and see. So if I go and turn up at a gig, it's not like it's, it's got so many overdubs that it suddenly loses that impact when you go and see a band live. And, and how was the experience of working with him? Because I think he's a legendary producer. Yeah, he's amazing. And uh, we lucked out big time by uh, f you know getting in touch with him. Uh, John Feldman, who did our uh, first record, um, and some other things as well. He actually put us in contact with Colin. Um, he was like, this guy would be great for you guys. He's 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 a little younger than us, and but he was a fan of Story of the Year as well. So he had a really good vision of where we should be going with our band and like what we should be sounding like now. And he really brought out some some cool qualities that maybe we wouldn't have got otherwise without like without his amazing producing brain. Um, but yeah, he he's he's amazing. Uh, he's a great songwriter. He's a great musician all around. And uh, like you said, he gets some big like rock and roll sounds, you know, like we wanted to make sure we still sound like a rock band, although we like having all the, the cool, you know, uh, fun bells and whistles and cool sound and stuff um, underneath, too. But we wanted it to be a guitar record where we're, you know, we, we're not trying to be a pop band. We want to keep being a rock band, you know, so he's great at getting big, big, awesome tones and uh, just everything about it. It was a great experience. And, and with a band like your um of your kind of status and your kind of level of performance i always think how do you kind of get that work-life balance because you know families come people get married people have children and bands don't have that kind of same drive or passion to go out there and try and you know win crowds over because their whole dynamic in life changes and i've said to you today like what keeps you hungry but that's something because you're, you're grateful because you're in a good position you're in a good band but how do you manage the balance of going on tour, those long nights, those kind of days away from home? And, you know, I'm I'm just over 40 now. And when I go to a gig, I ache the next day. So I can't even imagine being on stage and <laughs> performing for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. I'm 42. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, keeping your body in, in some kind of shape is is crucial nowadays. But, um, but yeah, uh, it. Uh, we, a few of us have kids. I have two kids. So it's like... Uh, leaving is a lot harder than it used to be for sure. Uh, 
and you know, I try to make sure that they understand like, this is what I do for a living. This is how I have money. This is how I have to go do this sometimes, you know, and they're, you know, that that's been their whole life. So they, they get it totally. But, but we try to keep the touring to a minimum, but we're trying to do a lot more right now uh, to promote a new record. And we want to still do it full time and be a band, but, but we try to keep it to like three weeks or so at the most that we want to be gone just cause you know, you don't want to, you don't want to miss that much of, of your kid's life for one. But uh, but it's better with some stable day to day life other than living in a tour bus and waking up in hotels and stuff. Uh, that 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 weighs on you after a while. It's hard. It's it's a crazy life. One thing I find, um, I do a Patreon and I get quite a lot of people emailing me that are on the Patreon. And you know, when I announce that bands are on, I always get the same questions coming from these people that want me to ask the same question to bands and. For a band that's been going 20 years, you've kind of seen that moment when everyone was queuing up to buy albums, everyone was buying CDs, and then obviously streaming came on board and kind of completely just blew that out of the water. Um, what advice do you give to a band that's starting out now? Because this is what I get. I got a lot of bands that listen and then one advice, but what advice do you give to someone who's right now trying to make it? Because... I think being in a band right now, you can't rely on CD sales or vinyl sales because everyone listens on Spotify. So yeah. what advice do you give to someone who wants to try and make a name for themselves in a business that's so busy and so hard to kind of break in? Yeah, it's weird. Uh, like you said, when we started, I was saying in a different interview, we had like VHS tapes that we would have like video footage of us that we gave to like to bands and stuff. And that ended up actually getting us signed was because we put a VHS tape video thing on somebody's bus. And it's like, uh, yeah, we were out there with hard copies of CDs, like trying to give them to people and sell them. Like we would be out at every show, like, you know, promoting with hard copies of things. And it's totally different. You know, I wouldn't even know how to start a band right now. It's it's like, it's just a totally different process. And, I, and obviously it's easier in ways and harder in ways because it's a lot easier to access music and get it to people. But then, you know, I guess it's easier to, or yeah, a lot easier to get lost in the shuffle as well. Cause you know, uh, who's going to find your band amidst all of this crazy ocean of music. So, um, I don't know. I, I think that no matter what, if you're passionate and you love what you're doing and you believe in what you're doing and you do it, you know, to the most best ability you can, I, I think that if you, the good stuff will, will make its way through, you know, if you just do what you love, uh, people are going to get it and they're going to like it. And uh, as long as you're into what you're doing, because it's not worth it, it's not worth, uh, you know, faking it and trying to be cool and like trying to do something that you think is going to be big or something. It's like, just be passionate and do what you love. And uh, the the honesty will will translate, I think, you know. I, I miss those days. I remember going to gigs locally um, in the UK and the bands that were playing that night, even the support bands would be standing on the door, giving away their two track CDs, you know, in little plastic wallets with kind of Sharpie written on because yep, we that had was that your connection. only chance. It wasn't like go home and listen to us on Apple podcasts or Apple, you know, iTunes or anything. It was like, here you go. So yep. I kind of miss that. And I miss like Krang and Metal Hammer it used to have like a CD on the front where you'd get like 12 tracks and yeah. you discover bands like Corn and Limp Biscuit and Deftones because they weren't out, you know, streaming on every bloody channel ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a totally different world. And, you know, obviously it's, it's better. And, uh, I, I love the, uh, the, the convenience of how easy it is to get the music you want to get nowadays. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't miss the uh, days of big ass 200 CD booklet <laughs> in the van and like trying to go through your CD like, where I know this, uh, I know this, motley crew cd is in here somewhere yeah it's like just that was so dumb to have to do all that now it's just so easy and it's all just in our phone i couldn't have ever seen that coming but uh it's obviously better and the technology has has advanced everything but makes it a little harder to sell music or to make any money in the music world but you know but that's it's a sacrifice you got to make i guess someone's listening right now and be like fucking hell mark and dan are these granddads talking about these what cds you actually <laughs> have to carry in. cds <laughs> so it was scratched yeah. once and i couldn't listen to it all <laughs> yeah i had to buy it again yeah uh i own it on cassette and cd yeah this is a really a really old conversation we're having right now evidently but i i might <laughs> I mean, sound old school man. but i i really miss uh and i thought this every day i got one of my pearl drum albums out and i miss the smell of the paper that the cds were in and all the lyrics and the photos and 
just there's something nostalgic about it and just putting that CD on again. I think it was the album Yield. And I remember like the cardboard on the front was cut out with the road sign and it made, yeah. and I was like, oh God, this is so much thought and effort's gone into it. And like people just don't get that now. Yeah, the the packaging used to be a a big deal, like especially in a band. Like our first couple of records, it was like we had to really design stuff for the you know for the hard copies. And now it's just like nope, you just make a cover and then you put it up on Spotify or whatever. And it's very simple. There's no like inside booklet. Although we are doing vinyl and stuff, so you know we'd still have to do some of that. But uh, which is cool that at least the vinyl resurgence is like there are, people do still want that you know they want more they want than ever album. yeah i mean that, yeah. that's delaying a lot of albums isn't it at the moment because everybody's trying to put in orders and then like yeah. it's just crazy yeah so it's still there's still a need for the physical thing sometimes but yeah and am i right in saying you're going to be touring with um is it yellow card later in the year yeah yeah the summer and uh here in the u.s we're doing a. Uh, doing the old story of the year yellow card mayday parade and uh this wild life uh yeah it's gonna be a fun summer uh we've known the yellow card guys for you know 20 years as well so we've been around with them since the beginning so it's it's fun to go out with your friends it's gonna be a good one that's awesome and i mean that that is a stacked lineup and every band's awesome but do you kind of have a different approach when you do a gig like that because i know a lot of people are there for you guys but obviously there's still that opportunity that's maybe some people there haven't heard of you or don't know of you so you kind of go to win some of that crowd over is it completely different like you don't rely on the fact that it's your own headline show yeah yeah you definitely have to go into every, all of these things you know you have to cater to like what what kind of show is this i mean kind of to a certain degree there's always just the normal songs we know we're going to play no matter what but but we are kind of a band that can chameleon in a bunch of different directions because uh, we have heavier songs and we have, you know, poppier songs. We kind of we do a lot of different stuff. So um, on, on a tour like that, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do yet. But um, but yeah, because uh, the weird thing is in a couple of weeks, we're going out with Slipknot in Australia. So it's like we're going to be on this big metal festival tour um, and then we go over to Yellow Card after that. So we kind of definitely have to do different different uh, set lists on those two different extremes but oh my god with Slipknot I mean they're playing download this year and I've seen them a few times and every time I see them they get better and better and it's just frightening how much power they have the moment they walk on stage like even if you're not a fan people are just drawn into the spectacle yeah. of the show and I mean that's such a contrast for you guys to play that sort of show to then yellow card yeah uh we were a little scared about that one it's like uh should we do that but yeah it's i'm, I'm excited it's gonna be great and I, I if nothing else i just get to watch slipknot every night so that'll be entertaining but it's a bonus but yeah i think it's gonna be good i kind of like being the weird the odd man out on these kind of shows and have to have to win people over i like that it's fun and is there any talk at the moment or anything you can confirm about any uk dates no, I can't. unfortunately we've been trying and trying to uh, get some things locked down. We've had a few offers and it's just they they don't work out. Uh, it's expensive, evidently, for us to get over there right now, and it's uh, monetarily we just can't make anything work yet. But but we have plans. We're still trying. We're working on some stuff. But don't, don't leave know. it too long. I know. Uh, it's I think last time we were there was slam dunk, like maybe th four or five. I don't know, three four years ago. And uh, but we only did the two shows and then came back home. So we. Once again, it was like that was all we could afford to do. It was like we couldn't get around. It was just, it's hard. Money makes everything not work. It's annoying, but we're it's trying. Crazy. It's crazy at the moment because of there's a big talk in the UK at the moment. A lot of people on social media are talking all about how kind of the venues are taking such a revenue off the merch and stuff. So yeah. Gajira have just come back off a UK tour here and everyone was outraged that they were charging like £40, like $50 for a T-shirt. But it's like... That's the only way we can do it because the venue wants, you know, 20 quid off every single T-shirt. And I think stop making it so tough for our good friends across the pond to come back, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been charging more for things as well lately just because, like, you know, everything's gotten crazy over the last few years. But, yeah, I, we used to try to keep everything as cheap as humanly possible, you know. But, but yeah, now, yeah, in order to do, make anything work, you kind of have to do that. It's weird. And is there anything else that you like to do that you would, you know, devote your time to outside of the band? And I know you said you're a father, but is there anything else? Like, do you ever want to look at directing music videos or making short films? Or is there anything else you've got a strong interest in that you kind of want to tick off your list in your life? Um, I don't know. I, I was uh, working at st a studio for a while and I have a little studio at my house as well. But I was recording bands for uh, for a little while, for a couple of years um, in 
uh, that that's fun. I love recording. I love the whole process. I just love everything about making music. Um, but then, you know, you get busy with your own band. So you kind of put that on the back burner, but, um, no, I'm not like, I'm not really a, a video kind of guy. I don't, I'm not real good at that kind of stuff. It's more just music, anything in the music world I love, but, um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I still try to skateboard a little bit in my life, uh, although it hurts a lot more in my 40s. But my son, he's, he skates and we will go ride skateboards and stuff. But uh, that was my other thing that I was really into in the early days. It was all skateboarding and music. So still trying to do that every once in a while. But I don't know. Most of the bands that I listen to today are because of skateboarding videos. Some of the old like Rodney Mullen videos and stuff like that I used to buy in VHS. This is me showing my age again. I have but the, sa- well. the soundtrack was incredible. And I'd be sitting there like, you didn't even have Google. You'd have to go like, what's this? Who's this yeah. by? And show your You'd friends. Watch, and they're like, watch the credits at the end. Yeah. Of the and uh, that was a great way to discover music. But I'm just too old to skateboard now. If I hold a skateboard or walk with a skateboard, people are like, who the fuck are you? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> That guy shouldn't have that. Yeah, yeah. When I, whenever I go to the skate park, at least if you have a kid with you, uh, your own son, it's like, oh, I get it. Dad's out there riding around with his kid. So uh, I'll say to the I, wife later, like, I want a child now so I can go to the yeah, skate park and not so get funny skate. looks. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if I go by myself, yeah, it's not as not as nice anymore. Amazing. Dan, what I do on this podcast, and it's my final question for you today, and I've done it on over 250 episodes now. Um, I put you on the spot for the final question, but I asked the artist, whoever's on, to pick the final song that's played. So once all this is edited and out there for the world to listen to, the final piece of music, and most bands don't choose their own, they go for something else, but what is a song or a piece of music or a piece of music from maybe a film or whatever it is that means a lot to you that after this is all done, you think would be the perfect song kind of that's personal to you for a certain reason? Oh man, uh, that's hard. That's hard. Out of all the songs in the world, fans struggle the most, especially songwriters, because they're like, "I have nine hundred songs in my head yeah. right now, and yeah, you want like one." Going through everything, um, I'm. Sh- uh, I, I have two things that make sense to me right now. One is a Skid Row song, and one would be like Descendants or something like like a more '90s kind of punk rock band. But uh, since I said that Sebastian Bach from Skid Row is my, my one of my favorite singers of all time, and uh, that's when we, we talked about what originally got me into wanting to be in a band, um, I think Youth Gone Wild by Skid Row is one of the best songs of all time. And uh, you can't really beat a good Skid Row song. The thing is, I usually ask why and what's the reason? Is there like a deep, meaningful reason? Some people are like, oh, it's the first song I heard when my child was born. Or it was at my wedding or it was the first song I picked up a guitar to. But you just summed it up, really. Like when I hear a Skid Row record and even if I'm not a massive fan, I know it's Skid Row and there's something about them that just, you know, Sebastian Bach's vocals are just fucking up there with me, with people like Axl Rose and Eddie Vedder is just iconic, strong vocals that you just instantly know. But what a band. What an absolute incredible singer. Yeah, and and I don't think a lot of people love Skid Row. Like they're not like some people love Motley Crue or Guns N' Roses. They're like the bigger ones of that genre, but but Skid Row was always like they had it was a little more punk rock. It was a little more like gritty and just like just badass and especially the vocals. Uh it like I said it's what made me want to be a singer in a band. I was like, "Man, that guy can sing better than anything I've ever heard in my life." And still, I listen back to those records and I'm like, "Wow." Wow, like I could never, I can't do that at all. You know, it's like I could fake it a little bit, but he had some crazy range, and it's, uh, it's still inspiring. Still inspiring, like thirty years later to to think about singing like that. It's crazy. Dan, thank you for so much uh, for giving me your time today, and I really hope it isn't too much longer that you get to come over. Like to hear it was like four or five slam dunks ago is just depressing. I just hope the world can change and the UK fans get to see you. But in the meantime, obviously, a brand new album is exciting. To play those new songs live is going to be really exciting because it must be tough as a songwriter in a, a band because everyone wants the hits and you then need to kind of bring those new songs in and test the water. Yeah, and you can't do too many. You just no. throw a couple new songs out there and you know, and uh, hopefully they translate. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You never know. But uh, your time is really appreciated and good luck with everything. And I hope our kind of paths cross when you are here and we can sort something out because uh, I'm a huge fan of your band and I really am excited for people to hear the new album. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for taking the time as well. And uh, yeah, we're working on it. We'll be over there as soon as we can. So 
So there it is. There's my interview with me and the amazing Dan from the incredible story of the year. And as you heard at the start of today's interview and throughout the interview itself, Tear Me to Pieces is the band's brand new album and is out now. Please go and listen to it. It's absolutely awesome. And I promise you, you will not regret it. If you've enjoyed today's interview, you know the score by now. Please share it. Jump on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. All the links are on markandme.com and share, share, share. It goes a massive way, costs you guys nothing to do and really helps get the word out there for Mark and me. You know this, I don't make money off this podcast and thanks to you guys at home for sharing it. It brings an audience to this podcast that money just can't buy. Also, if you've really enjoyed today's episode and you want to support me that extra mile, I do have a Patreon account. Each and every month I have an exclusive episode for you guys at home called The Lost Tapes. This is exclusively to you guys as my way of saying thank you for supporting the podcast and I interviews each and every month just for you guys that support me. Everyone else won't get to hear them unless you are part of the Patreon community. Not only that, you get some stickers, you get some badges, you get some newsletters and so much more. And honestly, I'm doing all I can to make you guys feel really special and really privileged and I thank you all for the support. I want to give a big shout out to the incredible Emma for making today's interview happen. This is someone behind the scenes that helps Mark and me each and every week. And honestly, I owe you my whole life. So thank you so much. I'll be back as always in a few days time with another brand new episode. Stay tuned this week for another big announcement as well following the 2000 Trees announcement. There's so much more coming out at the moment and I'm so excited. So until the new episode drops, listen to Tear Me to Pieces by Story of the Year. Take care of yourself. And I'll speak to you all very soon. Yeah.